Hi everyone, this is Ricky Spencer and welcome to 2022 Sociology of Media Voices series. Today I am very pleased that I've got interviewing somebody that's been one of my, how do I say it, someone I've admired for a long time and have looked up to and aspire that I can hopefully one day write as well as they can. And that, of course, is Rose Bellamy. And Rose's debut memoir, Mood, is a forthcoming um forthcoming with the uh, Wakefield Press in 2022. Uh, Mood explores the intersections between mental illness, uh, Jewish and queer identity and intergenerational trauma. Uh, Roz's writing has appeared in The Guardian, Overland, uh, Mianjian, The Sydney Morning Herald, SBS, Huffington Post, Island Magazine, Junkie, Kill Your Darlings, Pedestrian TV and Everyday Feminism and in the growing up queer in Australia uh, and living and loving in diversity. I thought I'd start with that because this incredible human being has contributed so much to the landscape of queerness writing in Australia. And now I would say overseas that Roz has not only given us a way forward, but also shown us ways that it's okay to be your authentic self and your intersectionality and experiences are an asset that you can incorporate within your lived experience self and share it if you so wish to the world. Uh, Roz is an experienced presenter, public speaker, interviewer and moderator. Uh, they have performed their work and presented at events including the Emerging Writers Festival, the National Young Writers Festival, the Melbourne Fringe and Queer Stories. They have been interviewed on podcasts, ABC Radio, Joy FM, 3CR, Channel 31, SBS. And in 2021, Roz was a writer in residence with the Moreland City Council. Without further ado, here is the fabulous Roz, everyone. Thank you so much, Ricky. I'm so excited to be talking to you today. And I've admired your work for a long time. So there's mutual admiration going on. Thank you. Ross, maybe tell us a little bit about your background first. Where do I begin? <laughs> well, your, um, your, your journey into writing, if we want to, yeah. dare I say such a word. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's a it's a funny question because it's like I've been writing since I was a child, you know, and encouraged by various family members and teachers along the way who sort of made a difference. Um, it wasn't really until I, maybe I was about 18 or 19 that I started writing about sexuality and then later gender in my writing. Um, and at first I did it really discreetly because I was ashamed. I had a lot of internalized homophobia, biphobia, um, even transphobia. Mm. And yeah, and so I had a lot of stuff to grapple with before I could put anything out about these topics, I think, into the public. Um, and so at first I only wrote fiction and poetry. Um, and I wrote these characters who were very much veiled versions of me, um, but I was too shy to, ex to explore anything like sex in the writing or um, mental health or any of those things I just I went very very surface level um, mm -hmm. and I very much wasn't ready to delve into it and that took I guess my whole 20s to get to that point you know through therapy through a lot of uh, a lot of self-reflection and unpacking um, and self-growth I think to get to a point where I had the confidence to even start putting even like a very mild version of what I wanted to say out there um, and I think I remember the first time I did that, um, uh, I wrote a piece about bisexuality. Um, I was sick of people making assumptions about my sexuality, either mm -hmm. as straight or as a lesbian. Um, and so I wrote this piece that I remember like sitting and writing on a tram and just being kind of furious, using the writing as a way to like cathartically explore all the things, all the, you know, all the assumptions people made constantly and just wrote this really furious piece. And it was so, so satisfying to write it and get it out there. Um, and I had a really amazing response from it. Um, a lot of people People in my life came out as bi to me privately, um, said that, you know, they weren't up to coming out about it. They were in opposite sex appearing relationships, um, but it voiced something for them that was really important to them. And I think that was the first time I had the sense of, 
oh, I can put myself on the line, make myself feel really vulnerable and really nervous. Um, and it's going to do something for other people as well, um, as well as for me, because I grew from that as well and became more confident to write the next piece and the next piece. Um, and yeah, I think it just became, a, particularly through my 30s, it became an experience of um, I'm scared and I'm shy and I'm nervous to write this. But if I do it, I know it's going to mean something to other people. And it's also going to be a continuation along this journey for me where I get to a, a place after that where I'm then more confident to do the next one and maybe delve into something I'm more scared to write about, like my gender identity. Mm -hmm. So each one has felt like a bit of a kind of stepping stone on the way to, you know, really getting that, that what you were talking about around authenticity that really strikes mm -hmm. a chord with me because, um, you know, at the beginning it was, oh, maybe I can give people one little crumb of who I am, you know, and I'll see how they take that. And then now I feel like I've gotten to the place where, you know, I have a book coming out this year and I tell more than I've ever told before. And I'm pretty scared about that too. And once that's out there in the world, it's like, who knows what's going to be next. <laughs> and yeah. tell us a bit, Rose, about the, the upcoming book. So you just mentioned briefly, it, it's sort of, an, I guess, a mirrored lens into you. Mm -hmm. um, how did you decide or what was the process of putting words to paper knowing mm. that what you're writing is really yourself it's a it's a character but it's truth telling in a way that's very revealing it's vulnerable how yeah. do you how do you do that as a writer like are you do you go through a process of self-censoring or do you kind of sit there thinking i am going to write this because i have to write this without yeah. thinking about the blinkers going on i feel like i've been through like maybe seven stages <laughs> like the seven mm. stages of grief but about being a memoir writer and i remember when i first started working on this project back in 2014 2015 and my entire focus back then was what will people in my life think what will my loved ones think will mm. they hate me will they want anything to do with me and that was the process back then and it was very much about self-censorship censorship so I, I worked with um, the American writer Cheryl Strayed and I remember, oh. yeah, one of the activities she gave us was write the thing that you're scared to write, like go off and do that, you wow. know, and wow. that one for me was really huge because that really everything fit into that category. I was scared of writing everything about myself um, and I went and did it and the only way I could do it was really telling myself I don't have to show this to anyone, I can mm. just write it, I can lock it up. Um, but then I think through that process and then in the, in the years since that as well, I've come through different places with it. So less about obsessing about what people are going to think and more uh, different layers to it. Am I telling the story the way I need to? Is there a point to this book? Is there something people are going to learn from it? Um, what is this book about? You know, originally I, th I thought it was entirely just about mental illness mm. and the symptoms that had come up seemingly out of the blue for me but then later on after writing it and editing it I realized a, a huge part of the story is about being a teacher um, as a queer non-binary person um, at a school where there wasn't really a huge amount of space for all the parts of my identity um, and the teaching story is a really huge part of it for me because uh, you know in my own schooling I was bullied really horribly and going back into the school environment was immensely triggering for me um, mm. as a teacher and even though you know we have this kind of binary or this dichotomy in society thinking like the teachers the authority and the students are down here the powerless ones I went in though with all those traumas that I hadn't fully like realized and made sense of or healed uh, and I brought them with me into the classroom and was re-traumatized promptly you know it just happened day in day out um, and so the story really became about that it's like so many symptoms of really severe mental illness came up for me in that environment because I was re-exposing myself this time as a teacher and finding that yes while I'd grown and changed and realized a lot about myself in other ways I still didn't feel safe you know I still didn't know how to protect myself um, and so ultimately it became a story of like I guess learning how to really take care of myself and protect mm -hmm. myself in a society that's not really set up for that for people who are other or different. And that's one of the most hardest things that both of us share in common um, both being teachers and for me it was a, like 
I don't know if you, but was a driving force because I was so bullied at school and every day, you know, and what was so difficult was that I didn't, I couldn't hide it. You know, my voice gave it away when mm -hmm. I was younger. So I couldn't be masked. And I remember when I was younger, I went through the stage where I used to cry and think, why couldn't I look like the other boys why couldn't I sound like them then I could hide my true self inside but mm -hmm. it was as though my soul wasn't allowing me to do that and it took me you know and I wasn't started teaching till I was 40 you know and I remembered that feeling um where I was going into the classroom and it was strange because it was like reliving but for me it was re-traumatizing really because I felt that as once I came out as being trans, uh, schools had a major problem with it. And more so, I would say, even the teaching staff mm -hmm. and the staff room, the actual staff room to me was the, the kind of the, the trigger because, yeah. you know, when you have people not sitting next to you or mm -hmm. the conversations are different, it, there's something that triggers you back to that space when you were younger yeah. where you would felt different. In your book, do you talk about that sense of feeling that you somehow feel different? And yeah. I'm curious to know, at a stage, did you ever go through that feelings that I guess that I'm talking about myself, where I would look at others and thought, I wish I was like you, or I wish I oh, could yeah. just have the friends that you, and be like a friend and have friends? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I'm, I mean, yeah, I relate to that a lot in lots of ways. And um, because the story starts for me um, as a, as a pre-service teacher. So mm. while I'm still learning to become a teacher and, you know, struggling with placements and being triggered along the way with each placement. And one of my placements was at a Catholic boys school. Mm. Um, and that's where I encountered the most transphobia. Um, oh, okay. And, yeah. And then um you know, going to these different school settings and finding the different prejudices that played out in these different environments. Each one had its strengths and then it's it's, mm. it's really awful discrimination and prejudices. Um, but yeah, in terms of what you're talking about, about like kind of looking at others, um, I, I was pretty lucky at the school where I worked as a grad teacher um, in the, I, you know, the, there was mostly a lot of um, support and respect among the staff, mostly, <laughs> um, but definitely a sense of watching other teachers and going, I wish I could be like you. I wish I could emulate you. I don't, I don't have that in me watching them, you know, with real, um, real, um, like awe, a sense of mm. awe and wishing I had that. And also looking at some of the students and see and wishing that as well, kind of going, you're so, you're so self-assured, you're so confident, you, you know, um, so constantly looking at, at the staff around and the students around and having this sense of just displacement and not fitting in to any of it. Is there any part of your book where you were writing that when you wrote a particular a particular section or chapter that you felt very challenged by what you've just written like what was in your head all of a sudden was in paper it was a yeah can you tell us if there was any uh Part or <laughs> without giving of... too much away because we want yeah. readers to read it but was yeah. there a particular part of the book or that really kind of you had to take a breath and think okay yes quite a, quite a few sections of the book mm. um you know when you ask that a few come up in mind that like even since this book has gone off to my editor and publisher I still sometimes I'm like should I cut that scene is that too oh, much okay. to tell that you know um and I think until it's out in print and it's kind of too late I'm probably still going to to and fro about it um because you know writing about people that you love and care about as well um we have complex relationships you know th mm. there's no perfect set of relationships everything is fraught to some degree and so to capture your story authentically you know mm. you can't leave that out you can't cut all of that out or your life just looks really fake and so those scenes are in there and I'm not sure yet how it's going to be received by everyone <laughs> yeah do you think that the the person Roz who started the book years ago is a different Roz today as a result of writing that book? Mm, such an interesting question. 
Um, I think so on some important levels, yes. Um, but on others, of course, I'm the same person. Um, you know, I will always, no matter what my life becomes, I will always be the same little shy, geeky, awkward enemy. Like that, that person's never going anywhere. <laughs> You know, even when I've had like moments that feel like, you know, great success or accomplishment or anything, I'm still that person like quaking on the inside going, I need to get home and hide under a blanket. Mm. Um, and so I'm still very much that in a, you know, same person, but then there's other things that have changed. And I think one, one big one was maybe through the written word, um, seeing things that I don't see so clearly, just experiencing it. So things mm. like boundaries with people, like mm. realizing certain relationships, certain dynamics, like kind of going, oh, on paper, I can really see how I might see this if I was reading about someone else. Like, you know, you need to cut that bullshit out. Like you need to tell that person, no, you need to put some protections up here. And so I think in that one way, there's like, that, that's how I've really changed looking at it. Like, no, there's these certain areas of my life where I need to really tidy up and tighten things up. And again, coming back to that kind of self-protection and having, you know, these important boundaries and self-protections in place. And I want to ask you something, Russ. Yeah. Why do you think so many or some people in the community have a problem with um, gender identity being their authentic self? And in, I'm thinking in relation to people who come out as not being cisgendered. Why do you think that some people still struggle with that sort of... Um, a presentation that some of us make you mean people who who are cisgender who don't accept mm, us mm. oh yeah oh <laughs> how long have we got Ricky? yeah well it's just yeah i just thought i want um, because I, I i look i've followed you for so long and, and you write mm. so eloquently and i always wonder like someone like yourself right have you had instances where professionally you know you could sense that uh, mm. with editorial panels or people interviewing you just you felt you know how we have that sense mm. that mm, this person is going yes. through the motions but that I can sense they really don't like my absolutely my myself if that makes sense yeah yeah why do I think they're like that I think there's so many layers to it, you know, I think for some people, because I've got all, all these people are coming into my head as, mm. as I try to answer that. For some of the people, I think it comes down to the religious upbringing or, you know, something cultural for them that they were taught um, that, mm. you know, for, for them, perhaps gender was like, almost like a religion in itself. It's like, that's the one thing that you get given at birth, that you have your whole life and you must protect it. And it's from your parents and it's from your doctor and it's from your God. And you must, you know, like something like that, like you must respect it. And these people, and I'm just trying to get into that mindset here. And, I'm, and they're almost like, how dare you challenge this one mm. given thing? I think that's one set of people. And then I think there's, I mean, I, I've encountered it from lots of people. So I'm thinking about them as well. And, you know, I don't know, some of it must come from fear, mm. you know, uh, a bunch of different types of fear. Like we know how fear has been weaponized against trans communities. Mm. Um, sometimes they've made it out like they're scared of us, like we're going to do something to them or to their children. Um, but sometimes it's like a different type of fear. Like if, if I were to accept you and your kind, then the world will change and become something I don't recognize. And I don't know how to live with that. You know, so maybe something like that. And I asked that question because I was wanting then to lead on to who do you hope will read the book within the community mm -hmm. the most? If there was a cohort of people we could dare say categorise, who would you love for, for people to read the book or the readership? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, I think um, queer and trans communities, even though, you know, I know there's that sense of preaching to the converted about particular mm. things, um, but I still think I'm, I hope there's a lot they can connect with. Um, you know, places where we can where we can see our own story reflected is important, um, and perhaps learning from lessons that you know I've gone through that perhaps the reader hasn't. Um, but then I guess like your question was sort of getting at as well, people who have very different experiences. Um, I definitely like them to engage with it. it 
it makes me nervous, you know, and that because some of them have a huge platform and they're very loud about being opposed um, to certain things. But yeah, I think I think maybe sometimes reading that opportunity to read the words of a community that you don't understand and get a sense of, you know, not just, oh, they're a person after all, but also look at their story. There are things I connect with in it. There's places where I can see myself. Um, maybe, you know, maybe that has the impact, uh, the sorry, the opportunity for to make an impact and have change there too. Mm. And I would love to see the book actually as a core text in, in for pre-service teachers. Why mm-hmm. do you feel that education is still sort of, unable to disrupt that heteronormative space yeah I was um when I started my PhD um I got to work on this research project around adolescent sexual health Mm. um and I didn't have much of a background in it apart from just my teaching background generally um but I was working with all these experts in the area of sex ed and sexual health and it was absolutely fascinating to me to kind of see who's trying to do what in this in this area and what things they're up against and you know particularly politically as we all know like Mm. i think you know the way that politics interferes with things like sex ed it's really it's abhorrent like anyway i won't go into a rant about that but um i i don't sorry (laughs) i've got no please don't but never say sorry that's one of the things i tell every guest words are so powerful and you're speaking from the heart is so valued here thank you yeah I, I think um when I was a pre-service teacher but also um as a sessional lecturer or tutor mm. working with um teachers to be um there's a real sense particularly in some of the younger generations coming up um that there is going to be difference like they, they've come to this from a different place from you know millennials gen x and older um they have a different understanding from the internet and from the communities they inhabit um but there's still gatekeepers stopping what they can do you know so the people like you said who are making uh, positions of leadership at schools or Mm. even just colleagues at schools if you're if you're a teacher the people making decisions about curriculum um, my wife, Rachel, she's a researcher in the area of early childhood education oh. um, and her PhD research looked at why the early childhood curriculum doesn't talk about gender at all. Oh. You know, it's, And she interviewed some of the policymakers who worked on the curriculum and it was really fascinating because she found that they tried to put so much in and everything they put in for the most part got taken out again, you know. And again, again and again, it came back to politics. And eventually they found ways of putting words in that almost acted like, you know, it gave you that possibility as if, you, if you're a teacher looking at it, they left space so that you could be creative and say, oh, it gives some examples. And one of the examples is postmodernism. I could interpret that as meaning <laughs> dot, dot, dot. But, you know, you know, people, experts in their field having to get creative because, there are political forces stopping you from teaching what research shows young people need. I think that's disgusting that we're still in that place, you know, from early childhood up to secondary and beyond, that we're still in that place where political and religious interests are stopping that important information from being shared with young people. And, Ros, do you ever envisage a time in the near future where teachers who identify as trans and gender diverse will be welcomed within schools and in classrooms? Or do you think that the institution of education needs to be completely um, remodeled and start up again? Mm -hmm. Or can we in fact evolve Mm -hmm. where we are now in the current system moving forward? Mm. Yeah. Um, I mean, at, when I was teaching, there were at least two of us who were gender diverse in that system. Um, kids kind of knew. And, um, you know, for one of the teachers, um, the, the students were pretty fluid about the language and, and labels and all that sort of thing and had open conversations with the teacher. This was in the public system. I've not seen it myself in the private, mm. you know, independent system. Although a friend of mine works at a private, uh, I think, Anglican school. 
Um, and he's told me all sorts of really great things that they do there. So I think, look, I think there's individual schools doing great things. Um, I think though on a systemic level, we need, we need change because otherwise it's, it's too hard. It's, um, it becomes an onus on the teachers in that school to make that difference. And, you know, people like you, like me, who go, I'm sure above and beyond, put in as much extra because they want to give the children what they didn't have mm. um, and offer that. And you need, you need protection. You need systems at the school that mean that you're not just sneaking that in in your own time. You know, you need that to be across the board and whole school practice, all that sort of thing. So, I mean, I don't know what the answer is to your question. Like, that's a huge question, but maybe we can get there. Maybe it needs a, a complete overhaul, but I'd like to think that, I don't know, enough good people pushing will change it. And I know so many people doing incredible work in all sorts of associated areas. Um, I'd like to think that we're going to get there. And now, Rose, um, with your book, what do you hope that it could perhaps become a play at some stage? Would you like to see your book um, projected out onto live um, theatre? You know, it's funny, I haven't actually thought about that, even though my sister's a playwright, and I see so many aspects of our family life and culture depicted in play form. Um, but I, for whatever reason, I haven't thought of it like that at all. Mm. Um, I just had that image of your book. And I, as I said to, I, to you earlier before we had, I can't wait to read it. Because for me, it's, I'd be able to relive some of my own experiences. But I just have that feeling that having your story uh, depicted on the on stage could really bring to life and a lot of those emotional trauma issues mm. that are raw that you're dealing with really perhaps capture the audience within their own lived experiences of whatever marginalization that they faced at school and their mm -hmm. journey into adulthood. It's a great idea. Mm. Well, everyone, if we're out there, we could look for some funding because yeah. I think this would be a fabulous project because we need these sorts of lived stories of truth telling for all the community, allies and everyone mm. to see the difficulty and complexity of identity and that it's not just one dimensional, but it's multifaceted and it's yeah. political and it's religious and it's notions of familyhood, notions of womanhood, manhood, personhood. So mm. what's next? I'm curious now, what's next for Roz? Um, yeah, my mind is still whirring with options about <laughs> theatrical versions. Mm. Um, and I think you're right. Like, I think when I've seen any productions involving school settings, it tends to be about the adolescence experience, not about the teacher necessarily. I can't mm. think of too many examples of, of that, particularly trans and gender diverse teachers. I think, you know, we're an area that's overlooked because we're too difficult for the system. So I think it's a great suggestion on your part. Um, in terms of what's next, um, my PhD is due in a few months. Wow. So, <laughs> so and we're moment, gonna get you back to talk all about your PhD once it's um published. Yeah, when it's off. Yeah, that's gonna be exciting. I'm looking forward to chatting about it once it's done. <laughs> please do. And can you for the listeners out there, can you please just give us a, a quick synopsis of, of your PhD? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I ran life writing, so autobiographical um, workshops with young queer and trans people. Mm -hmm. um, so they were age 16 to 20. I ran these right before the pandemic began, which was oh, really good timing. Yeah, yeah. And then I collected mm -hmm. their writing over a series of weeks. Um, so up to about seven pieces of writing per individual who participated. Mm. And then I've analysed them over time. So looking at themes that emerge, um, some of them submitted pieces once COVID had begun. So I looked at how COVID was impacting on them as well, um, particularly for um, some of them who are people of colour um, and experiencing racism as a result of COVID particularly. Um, and so when I set out to do the PhD, I was very focused on well-being, um, especially coming straight from high school teaching into the PhD. I was like, 
the school environment does not have enough stuff around well-being that is holistic for young people. So I very much had just a very process focused, like I'm going to run this life writing workshop and they're going to magically spill out all these things. And it's all, you know, that's how I came into it, seeing it. And I've come out with very sort of different findings, but still things that are in line with what I wanted to do, which is good. Um, so learning so much about how young people and or really any age but you know particularly from these young participants how they make sense of themselves on the page um how they make meaning about their lives about their gendered identities their sexual subjectivities things like that um how they write about themselves how they describe their bodies um, some of the participants were going through gender affirming treatment at the time and the way that they wrote about themselves changed their pronouns changed sometimes in the middle of a piece they swapped pronouns oh. about themselves some of them talked about writing teaching them to look at their body differently um, so one of them wrote about how they'd always hated and rejected their body but um, there's this quote that really still sticks with me about through writing this they began to see their body as something that's you know supported them and nourished them and gotten them through these situations um, so really getting a sense of what writing can do particularly for young people going through really challenging times, how it can be a source of support. That's incredible. And can't wait to talk more about that in detail. If people out there would love to contact you or follow you with your, are there social media platforms that people can contact you or, or follow you? Yeah, absolutely. So on Twitter, my handle is Bella Roz, so B E L L A. R O double Z. Um, I'm usually on there being loud and opinionated about various things. Um, that's the same handle for Instagram as well. Um, and my website is rosbellamy.com. So pretty simple. And that has links to all the different social media accounts as well. Oh, that look, it's been a fabulous um, uh, time spent with you, Ros. Uh, we look forward to, uh, to having another one soon to because there's so much we we haven't had a chance to unpack and explore yeah. and i just wanted to leave everyone again what is the title of your upcoming book so it's currently titled mood um that's going to stay its title there might be a subtitle added who knows we've got the fun editing process coming up at the moment um but yeah mood m-o-o-d um kind of picked because it explores my bipolar self um as well as you know all the different aspects of mood that come up when you're doing a job as hectic as teaching <laughs> exciting and we'll keep our listeners up to date uh when the book does come out and being be able to pre-order this incredible um text that i hope that we'll be able to um push for or lobby in schools because not only for teachers but most importantly for students to really disrupt notions of um, mental unwellness uh, gender um, identity and acceptance you know of teaching and teachers that diversity really is the key to our future Ros uh, Bellamy, it's been an absolute pleasure and thank you for spending some time with us today on Voices. Thank you so much, Ricky. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you.